Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Kansas City Public Library, our central library. My name is Lorenzo Butler. I'm the communication specialist here for the library. Um, we are honored to have you all here tonight um, to listen to a presentation by Professor Sean Lee Alexander. Um, and just let me start by saying, you know, as someone in his 30s who's a black man, growing up in America, you, you get a sense of, very little sense of black history in the history books that I studied. Um, anything that I really learned about black history in school was based on the NAACP, the Civil Rights Movement of the 50s, and forward. So it's a pleasure uh, to have Professor Alexander here tonight to discuss the struggle that occurred before the NAACP period. It's a struggle that's not only a black struggle, but it's an American struggle, and it's America's history. So I'm glad to have him here to discuss that. Um, Professor Alexander received his PhD from W.E.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And he is currently an assistant professor of African and African-American studies and the interim director of the Langston Hughes Center at the University of Kansas. His area of research concentration is African-American social and intellectual history of the 19th and 20th centuries. Prior to joining the University of Kansas, Professor Alexander taught at U UMass Amherst Gettysburg College and Yale University, where he was the first Cassius Marcellus Clay, I know him as Muhammad Ali, uh, fellow in the Department of History. Uh, Professor Alexander is also prolific in the literary world, having published an anthology of T. Thomas Fortune's writings entitled T. Thomas Fortune, the Afro-American Agitator. He also published work on early Ameri African American civil rights activity in the Great Plains Quarterly and in radicalism in the South since Reconstruction. Currently, he's completing a study of the violence of the Reconstruction period entitled Reconstruction, Violence, and the Ku Klux Klan Hearings, as well as a short study of W.E.B. Du Bois for the Roman and Littlefield Library of African American Biography Series entitled W.E.B. Du Bois, an American Intellectual and Activist. But we are very privileged to have him here tonight to discuss um, his study that he completed on African American civil rights activities in the post reconstruction era entitled An Army of Lions The Struggle for Civil Rights Before the NAACP. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I present Professor Sean Lee Alexander. Thank you for everyone for coming out tonight. It's, it's always a, a pleasure to, to see such a, a large crowd, and it's even more of a pleasure to have a large crowd at a library, which is um, wonderful in, in many ways. Um, and it's my first time actually at the, the Central Library here and it's a beautiful space. So um, I hope that you, you do come here quite often and, and enjoy it. So it's, I came a little early and wandered around, which you know, most archive rats usually do. And uh, uh, it, was, it was very nice. So, um, so this has been a wonderful space to be in. What I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, these pre-civil rights organizations and some of the individuals involved uh, and give you a little bit of history of how they develop and then at the same time move us um, towards allowing you to ask more questions because the, as Lorenzo explained, you know, the, the typical story of civil rights in America does uh, begin with the NAACP. Uh, or we jump directly to the modern civil rights movement, which we have, of course, really being sparked in 1954 with a decision down the road in Topeka, Kansas, uh, with five other places, which is, of course, important to remember that we often forget in that, right? It's five locations that bring suit, Topeka being one of them. Or if we move back a little bit more in time, we usually like to talk about the Niagara movement in 1905 being created by a man named W.E. Du Bois. And Du Bois creates that organization with a number of other individuals, including Clinton Morgan, William Monroe Trotter, Frederick McGee, and others. And people like to look at that as the kind of the origins of the sparks of the creation of the NAACP, at least, which comes in 1909. But the problem with that scholarship is the only reason that we choose that is because that's what Du Bois has told us is the truth. And Du Bois lives a long time and is one incredible activist and scholar. Right? But we are very Du Bois-centered in our understanding of the late 19th 
and into the 20th century ideas of African-American protest and civil rights activity. I always say it's also somewhat because he outlives everyone, right? And he rewrites the story. If you read his first incarnation of the civil, the beginning of the Niagara movement, everyone's there helping him. By the final version uh, in his last autobiography, uh, he's the only one that forms it, right? It's not bad. It's, you get to outlive everyone. You get to, you get to take credit. And he's a very extremely important person. But in this early period, he's actually not as influential as people want to think. Um, he, he's, he's developing intellectually and as an activist in this early period. It's really once he becomes an activist in the NAACP and gets his hand on the Crisis Magazine, right? The NAACP's organ or, or, or journal, right? Magazine that they're publishing. It's in that, dec that first decade that he has control of that from 1919, 1910 to 1919, 1920. That's when he cuts his teeth really as the political activist that we know today. And we all place that man back in time and think that he's the same person that he was when he's 12 years old, writing for the New York Age, as he is as he's 25, right? as he is that he's 30, et cetera. But that's not the case at all. And he actually tells us that. In 1935, he publishes a piece in the Journal of Negro Education, which says, I didn't start all this. It was actually an organization called the Afro-American League. But of course they did nothing and I took the lead and we, we went on, right? But he at least acknowledges it at, at that point. And most people never take us back to that period, right? And understand that organization and what they're doing in the creation of that. So that's what I'm gonna walk you through a little bit tonight, is the creation of the Afro-American League, give you a little bit of discussion of the organizations that form in its wake and then um, give you a little bit of the Kansas, Missouri tidbits, and then open it up for questions so we can talk about it a little bit more. So, the period of the late 19th and early 20th centuries is one, represents one of the darkest epochs in American race relations. Now, during this period of the nadir, as we call it, African Americans responded to their social conditions in numerous ways including, among others, the promotion of self-help, racial solidarity, economic nationalism, and political agitation. I will discuss the political agitation of the Afro-American League, the country's first national civil rights organization. The instigator of this organization is a man named T. Thomas Fortune. In 1884, Fortune used the editorial page of his newspaper, the New York Globe, to promote the formation of a national civil rights organization to defend against the nation's increasingly hostile reactions to the reconstruction legislation that guaranteed equal rights to the country's black citizens. Slowly beginning in 1887, the African American De League developed on the local and state arenas. And in 1890, the organization met for its inaugural convention in Chicago. Over the three, its three years of existence, it does start a number of efforts, challenging de facto discrimination in the North. The League tested discrimination in restaurants in Minnesota, as well as New York, with a, ca with a case of its second president, T. Thomas Fortune, against the Trainer Hotel, which became kind of a, an embarrassing cause celebre for the, for the movement because Fortune's uh, idea or fondness for drink. The group also successfully challenged attempts to segregate schools in Ohio, discrimination in insurance rates in New York, and its lone Southern case issued against a suit against the separate coach laws of Tennessee. Now despite these in small instances of success, however, the League, ever financially deficient, folded in the early months of 1893, less than a year after proclaiming the organization defunct. Fortune attempted to no avail to rekindle the league flame around the anti-lynching activities of Ida B. Wells, but ultimately the league quickly faded from the national scene and went down into the local scene. So let's talk about a little bit what they actually do and why Fortune calls for the creation of this organization. In 1883, in the United States Supreme Court, 
the court makes an extremely important decision that our, we often forget in American history. Simply called the civil rights cases, cumbled together five court cases, very similar to Brown v. Board. The Supreme Court sits down and begins to think about whether or not the nation's Civil Rights Act of 1875 is constitutional or not. Now, what does the Civil Rights Act of 1875 do? The Civil Rights Act of 1875 tells us that it is not okay to discriminate against people in places of a public and private accommodation, right? Which is following up on the 14th and 15th Amendments, and ultimately it's a bill that they passed in 75, and they really passed it in honor of Charles Sumner, who had just died. It was the bill that he had tried to push through Congress for five years, right? That's why when you remember back in those early days of the Obama administration and and Kennedy passed away, right? And people kept saying, you need to do it for the old man just like they did for Sumner, right? You got two Massachusetts senators, right? Pushing lifelong ideas. And that's what they're actually talking, they were talking about, right? It's in 1875, they passed this law. What they don't get in the law is education, right? Everything else is okay, but the, what they strip out of it is education. And that's what kept hanging it up in Congress, right? Is that, it, that Sumner wouldn't back down on education that education also should not be segregated, was his claim, right? And the, the, the Congress would not support that. And so they took that out after he passed away, and they got it in. So in 1883, the court sits down and decides this. One of the early court cases, it's important to understand this in the, in the Kansas, Missouri area. There's one out of Missouri and there's one out of Kansas that are come together, ultimately begin to build up the lower steam. The one out of Kansas happens in Hiawatha, Kansas, right? And I always bring that one up because it happens in 1881. So, and I always bring it up because we like to, you know, as residents of Kansas, we always like to think that we're the free state, right? And we're the state that uh, had John Brown, right? And we're the state that had, you know, no racism whatsoever, right? Because John Brown was there, we didn't have slavery, we fought Missouri, et cetera, right? But of course, what happens in Hiawatha in 1881 is a man is refer refused hotel accommodation. His name is Bird G. He files suit, ultimately. That suit is taken into the court systems, rises up. He doesn't win. It continues to go higher and higher, and ultimately is cobbled together, right? And becomes one of the smaller cases that's, that kind of gave the, the energy to that civil rights case before 1883. And I bring that up because what Kansas really should claim, because what we always talk about is that we're the, also the place of Brown v. Board. But what everyone always like, forgets to think, of course, is Brown v. Board happens because we have segregation, right? And in actuality then, with 1883 and, eight, and 1954, the, the state of Kansas is at the bookends of the creation and ending, or the beginning of the end, of segregation within this country, right? So it's an important event, and I don't think Kansans should forget about it too much. So the Supreme Court ultimately rules that this, this Civil Rights Act of 1875 is unconstitutional, that you cannot um, tell a place of public, private and public uh, establishments that they cannot discriminate, that it's okay to discriminate. Now, right there, that should send a bell off in most people's minds because the historical narrative that we use is it doesn't happen until 1896 with Plessy versus Ferguson, right? But Plessy versus Ferguson is simply in, in its simplest form, confirming the 1883 decision, right? And saying it's okay to, to segregate people on the train systems, uh, in particular the train systems, right? So that's one thing. T. Thomas Fortune writes in his newspaper that the, the week of that event and says, the black community feels like we've been baptized in ice water today. Right? The federal government is turning its back on us. They're backpedaling from the civil rights legislation. They're backpedaling from the 14th and 15th Amendment. We need a voice. We need a voice out there. Shortly after the event, the Supreme Court, in Danville, Virginia, they come before the black community. The, t the tensions are rising because a small group of, of African Americans have gained a, a limited amount of autonomy in the community. But according to that limited amount of autonomy for the community, the white community looks at that and says, we've got Negro domination, right? Because you've got one or two blacks in the municipal system, right? And we must stop this. 
And so the next election, we're going to stop this. And as we get closer and closer to the election, tensions rise. And one day, an African American is walking down the street and doesn't step off the sidewalk for a white man. They brush elbows, and a fight ensues. And that evening, the black community of, of Danville is attacked by the white community. Riot, a racial riot occurs. They kill a number of African Americans, wound even more. And they tell the African American population, do not come to the polls this week. If you come to the polls this week, we will kill you. We will take back the, our positions of power by the ballot or by the bullet. And so the black community, some individuals do try to go to the polls. They are intimidated away. Uh, and the whites in the community do win back those seats. Again, fortune rises up and says, no more Danvilles. We need a voice in the black community to speak out for us. We need a voice to speak out and challenge these instances that are occurring. Right? We need someone to speak for the community. The abolitionists are gone. Right? We need a black voice to rise up. And so he calls for the creation of a civil rights organization, national on scope, but local activity is what should drive it. And so he, he calls for this in 1884 and gets a few individuals to support him, but not a lot. But he doesn't forget. He keeps trumping it up in his paper and discussing it for those three years of 1884 to 1887. 1887, he, he begins to speak even louder, calling out for this organization. 1887, he makes a, a passionate call for the organization. And he gets a number of people writing back to him, people that you certainly know. Ida B. Wells Barnett, who, Ida B. Wells, who will ultimately become Ida B. Wells Bar Barnett, writes to him and says, this is the greatest idea our race has ever had. We need this organization. People like Booker T. Washington, surprises everyone, of course, right? Booker T. Washington, that man of accommodation, that man that never is supposed to stand up, right? The man who accommodates the entire South, writes to Fortune and says, push the battle to the gate, but beware of forming on the mountaintops and do not forget the valleys. He's telling him not to forget the masses. Don't let this be an elite organization. Right? But he is there promoting this organization. And one of, his, one of Fortune's greatest cohorts, a man named T. McCant Stewart, one of those individuals that we don't know, says that we need a group of activists with leather stomachs who will go in and push the battle, who will go in and sit in a restaurant until they are beaten and dragged out. 1887, not 1960, 1961, or 1958 in Wichita, right? 1887. And so it's T. Thomas Fortune and his friend T. McCann Stewart, who is a lawyer in New York, right, who draft up the plan for the creation of this organization, draft up its platform. And what they call for is that they, they, we need an organization that will up, demand that the country upholds the 14th and 15th Amendments as well as end racial violence in this country. Because what we have is we have coming off Reconstruction, and we never add these numbers in when we talk about violence in this country. Right? The two things that we never talk about when we talk about Reconstruction and post-Reconstruction is the dead black bodies. Right? And we have in Reconstruction 20 to 50,000, and I go to the 50,000, individuals being killed throughout the South. 20,000 is the government number. I think it's much higher. And if you read early black writers, they're using the higher number. Right. So we have 20 to 50,000 people being killed by the Klan violence between 1866 and 1875. Right. And we have a whole lot of congressional hearings, 13 volumes, where the Congress goes down into the South and investigates these lynchings these murders, black and white, interviews the people who survived the terrorization as well as the perpetrators of the crimes. Right? 13 volumes of 16 page, 600 pages each. And it's forgotten in history for the most part. T. Thomas Fortune calls it those bulky 13 volumes that haunt me on my bookshelf. Right? This is what's politicizing him. He grows up as a child in Reconstruction. His father is a Re Reconstruction politician in Florida. 
and he experiences this terrorization. His father teaches his young son and his brother and his mother how to flip over the bed and get the guns that are under the bed and defend themselves when the clan comes through the door. Because I'm not coming home tonight because they're circling the house. Right? This is what politicizes this man. So when he sees the violence in a place like Danville, he understands what's going on. He understands the violence that people are living through. And that's why when he creates this organization, he also looks to this house and says, you may not be able to support us right now. And I understand that. Because if you stick out your head, you may be in serious trouble. But we will do everything we can in the north and fight where we can. Right? And so it's this type of violence, as well as the rising lynchings that take place in the post-Reconstruction period, that Fortune and his group are responding to. Right? Hundreds of people being killed. And it is no coincidence that it's the mid-1880s, the exact time that Fortune is calling for the creation of this organization, that we actually have two groups beginning to keep statistical records of the amount of bodies being collected in the South because the number is rising so much. Right? Those two places are the Chicago Tribune, and lo and behold, Tuskegee Institute in Alabama with Booker T. Washington. He understands what's going on. So they come together in 1890 and create this civil rights organization, calling for the upholding of the 14th and 15th Amendments and the end of racial violence. And how are we going to do it, he tells everyone. We're going to do it because we have the courage to stand up. And we're going to do it because we're going to take these court cases in to the court system and challenge these unright civil rights legislation. We're going to do it by filling the, the, air, the, the press with propaganda, right? with information, flooding them with information, responding to the violence that they're seeing, right? the statistics that they're seeing. Because this is happening at the exact same time that the U.S. is becoming more of a white supremacist nation. Right? The idea of the, the racial idea of the South is becoming more and more the northern idea of the South and therefore the, nor the, the national idea of race. And so those type of things is what Fortune and his cohorts are beginning to do. One of the first court cases that they do is in St. Paul, Minnesota. There's a place called the Delicatessen, right? It's a wonderful name for a restaurant, right? It's always what it should be. There's a man named William Hazel who goes into the restaurant and is denied service. Well, William Hazel happens to be, he's an architect in the black community of St. Paul, but he also happens to be a member of the Afro-American League. And he says, okay, you've denied me service. Local Afro-American League, let's take him to court. Right? They take him to court and they ultimately win their court case. Get a small amount of money, and then they're also told the delicatessen that you can't do this. And why can't you do this? Because what happens in the North, after that civil rights legislation in 1883, is the Northern states begin to write civil rights legislation of their own, saying it's not okay in the North to segregate, right? Legally. Doesn't mean that people don't do it on practice. But legally, you cannot do it in various states. Saint, in Minnesota, it's one of them that it passed an early one in the late 1880s. And then Hazel tries this at this restaurant. He's denied. And what I always bring up Hazel is because three years later, 1893, a woman named Rosa Hazel walks into the Delicatessen restaurant. Happens to be William's wife. What do you think the Delicatessen does? They deny Rosa service. Rosa takes him to court and wins her court case. I always look back on that one and say, you can deny anyone, but the Hazels walk in the house. You know, you, you've got to serve them, right? They've already taken you to court once. Why wouldn't you do it again? Right? So the Afro-American League does small court cases like this in, throughout the North in its three-year period as a national organization. Branches of the Afro-American League sprout up as early as 1887 in Kansas City and Topeka 
right, and Kansas City, Kansas, and Wichita, Kansas, Parsons, Kansas, right, numerous places throughout this, this community. Right. By 1880, 1893, the organization has kind of run its course mainly because they can't get the masses to support them. They're, cert they're hurting for money. Fortune has basically gone into debt trying to run these court cases. Right? And so the organization, he says, we cannot run on the national level anymore. We must lower ourselves, our banner, and push this only on the local level. Kind of go underground at the moment. And so most historians have looked at this organization then and said, okay, the Afro-American tried something, but they're a failure. Because they only have looked at the national organization and what the national organization does. But if you begin to track in the historical record, on the local level, that, that organization stays active in 1894, in 1895, in 1896, 97. And by 97, you begin to get this call within the community again that we again need a national civil rights organization because something happened in 1896 which we all have known and I've already mentioned, right? Plessy versus Ferguson. And so the black community again says, see, they're spreading this. We need a national organization. Where was our voice to speak out against Plessy? We need an organization to stand up. And then in 1898, there are two, two black postmaster generals who are killed, local postmaster generals. And the black community says, why? Because they're government officials? They're murdered? Where again is the outrage by the national government? Right? This is a federal employee being murdered, and we're doing nothing. Where is, the, where is the voice in the black community? And also in 1898, we have a Supreme Court decision in Williams versus Mississippi. Williams versus Mississippi is a simple case where they look back on the idea of disenfranchising black voters. It begins in Mississippi with the Mississippi Plan in 1890, where they've come up with ideas of poll tax and literacy clauses. And it ultimately grows out into the grandfather clause, right, which we all have heard about at different times. Right? But in 1898, the Supreme Court decides that, we, that Mississippi is not actually doing anything wrong. Because they can discriminate by um, poll tax a white or a black voter. So it's not based on race. Or the literacy clause, they can certainly eliminate a white voter for literacy, so it's not based on race. Now statistically, we know that that's not the case. Right? That if a white man is behind the desk telling a white person to interpret the Bible, it doesn't matter what that person says, they're gonna be able to vote. And if an African American man walks up to them and reads from the Bible and interprets it perfectly fine, he is going to be told he didn't interpret it right. right. And so, but the Supreme Court says that's not the case. Right. We can see no real reason that this law is written to disenfranchise only black citizens. So it's okay. So the black community then rises up again and says, we need to revive the Afro-American League. We need to again speak out as a national organization, an organization that challenges us as a community to organize, as well as challenges this, the country to uphold the 14th and 15th Amendments, as, as well as end racial violence. And so they organize the organization again, and they decide they're not going to call it the Afro-American League this time, though the ideas are the same and most of the people who are involved are the same. They're going to call it the Afro-American Council. And so all those organizations that organized on the, stayed together on the local level Within the next year, they become the Afro-American Council rather than the local Topeka branch of the Afro-American League. And so you see this organization folding into it. Right? It's the same individuals in the same platform. But what they do is a little bit different. They get more support at the get-go. They create an anti-lynching bureau. They create a legislation bureau. And so they kind of delegate the activities of this organization out to a little, few more people. The Anti-Lynching Bureau is headed by one Ida B. Wells Barnett. 
Another, the, another person that helps uh, manage the Anti-Lynching Bureau is a man named John Mitchell Jr. Runs the Richmond Planet out of Virginia. Two incredible people. All those pamphlets that if you know the, it, in black history, Ida B. Wells writes a number of anti-lynching pamphlets, Southern Horrors, right? The Red Record, right? about Robert Charles in New Orleans. Most of these, these pamphlets are written while she is the head of the Afro-American Council's Anti-Lynching Bureau. It is her job to write these pamphlets. She is going around the country selling these pamphlets. She is going around the country raising money to create these pamphlets. It is what she's supposed to do. The other thing that the Anti-Lynching Bureau organization does is they begin to draft an anti-lynching piece of legislation. And that's a question that we all have to ask. This is murder. You're killing people. But because the local and national and the local and state governments are not reacting, and the federal government can't come into it, nothing is being done. And so we have the Afro-American Council beginning to draft a bill written by a guy named Edward Brown out of Boston, Daniel Murray out of DC, he's actually a congressional librarian. Ida B. Wells working on it a little bit, but the other person mainly is George White, representative out of North Carolina. And he's their ticket, right? Because he's the guy who can actually get the bill before Congress. It's really drafted by Brown and Murray, but White is the man that can bring it for, before Congress. In 1901, White is, knows he's done, that his, his county, has, his area has been gerrymandered enough, he's gonna lose votes, he's not gonna have the position anymore. When he ultimately st is, is removed from office, it's the last person that's voted in from the Southern Congressional District until the 1970s. Right? But he does try to put the bill in, into Congress, and it goes nowhere. Congress tables it and says that we're not going to discuss it. Right? And you know that if your, your bill isn't discussed on the floor of Congress, it doesn't become part of the congressional record, therefore it doesn't, doesn't become part of the, the historical record. In the middle of a discussion on the Puerto Rican tariff, George White stands up and begins to read his bill to call for the country to end lynching. And he proceeds to read the bill and expert testimony on why the bill should be passed, letters from people like uh, lawyers from, from Boston, right, white and black lawyers supporting his cause. And you can imagine that he is feeling proud because he knows that they're not going to do anything. But he knows now that this is in the record and we can now stand up for something, right? He sits down. And the congressional record proceeds like the man never even spoke a word. They go right back to the Puerto Rican, Rican tariff right, and continue through. But because of that, we have a record of this and this attempt, right, which is unique. The other thing that the, the, one of the other things that the Afro-American Council does is they begin to institute test cases no different than the Afro-American League. And they begin to focus on voting in particular. The first case that they're going to line up is in Louisiana. They're going to challenge that grandfather clause. Right? And then, so they begin to raise money for those court cases and challenge things. And then they begin to get letters from a guy in Alabama, Tuskegee, Alabama, who's helping them raise money on the Louisiana case. And Booker T. Washington writes them, a guy named Jesse Lawson, and says, you know, they're about ready to disenfranchise the black population of Alabama. I don't think that's very good. Do you think the Afro-American Council can take this on? And they do. He's, Jesse Watson writes back and says, yeah, I think we got $100 left in the coffers, and we can begin to do something. We can raise some more money. Why don't you send me the proposed bill? We'll draft a, a pamphlet. We'll send it out to educate the, pub the public of Alabama on how to register to vote ahead of this legislation and what we should do, right? And this ultimately becomes the two famous Giles cases that both reach the Supreme Court. They are, they are Afro-American Council cases. They are run by Afro-American Council individuals, and they are 
raised money by the Afro-American Council to do them. But Booker T. Washington is behind it, and he is funding this organization. The story of the Afro-American Council is that because Booker T. Washington is there, this organization is conservative. It's not radical, it's backwards. And the main reason for that argument is because of his public discussions, the way he speaks about, I'm not going to rock the boat, basically, is what he's saying, right? He all, in, in the end, what he's really telling the Southern community is, leave us alone. Leave the black community alone. We'll create our own community, and we'll thrive in this segregated space, right? And then once we have money, once we have the build, building of economic nationalism, well, you have to allow us to compete, right? Simplistically, that's what his argument is, right? But it's ultimately, leave us alone. We interpret it as, I'm not going, I'm accommodating you, but he's really telling them, leave me alone and leave the white population, leave the rest of the black population alone. Give them to me, right? But what he's doing behind the scenes is funding all these court cases. But because of those public ideas, Pronunci pronunciations, right? What he's talking about. The core of the black community begins to look at him in a negative light. Right? And so you have people like William Monroe Trotter and W. Du Bois and, 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 and um, Ida B. Wells all beginning to speak out on him. Right? And it's the fight is actually happening within the Afro-American Council. The council meets in 1902 in St. Paul, Minnesota. His good friend, Frederick McGee, and if you remember, I said Frederick McGee starts the Niagara movement. But his friend, Frederick McGee, writes him and says, you need to come to St. Paul because there's people that are going to speak out against you. And you need, there to, you need to be there to speak for yourself. Right? And so he does come. And William Monroe Trotter thinks he's going to cause a coup. He's going to turn him over, challenge him. Trotter never makes the meeting. He actually gets held up on the way there. But Du Bois is there. And when there's a push to condemn Booker T. Washington and his activities, one of the first people to stand up and defend the man is Du Bois. And the next, in the next week of the paper, the, Guard, the Boston Guardian, William Monroe Trotter's paper, he writes and says, we've got to discount Du Bois. He's a traitor. He didn't stand up against Booker T. Washington, right? And then we go down the next year in 1903 in Louisville, Kentucky. And there's a knockdown, drag out fight. The fight happens because they come up to a podium and then in front of the, po the room, there's a picture of Booker T. Washington, a painting of Booker T. Washington on this side, and there's a painting of Tuskegee on that side. And before anyone can figure out why those pictures are there, William Monroe Trotter, William Ferris, and others begin to start yelling and screaming and saying this meeting cannot proceed with a picture of Booker T. Washington on the stage. And we need a person that stands for higher education and political agitation on the, the stage. And what they do is they decide that they're going to put a picture of J.C. Price, former president of Livingston College, more importantly, the first president of the Afro-American League on the other side. What they don't know is those pictures are on the stage because a local artist in Louisville, Kentucky painted them and was giving them as a gift to Tuskegee. Right? Ultimately, Trotter and his friends at this meeting don't really get much accomplished on challenging Booker T. Washington and his public persona. But the Afro-American Council comes out of the meeting saying we're going to continue our court cases, we're going to continue agitation in various locations, right? What they forget, what, they, what Trotter, though, does is goes back to Boston, and he realizes this happens in July of 1903, and he realizes, hey, Booker T. Washington has actually scheduled a meeting in Boston, Massachusetts in just a couple months. We'll take him on there. And at this meeting, they have, a, again, a large fight uh, between intellectual fight, yelling of sorts, pepper spray, right? The typical fights that you have at lectures, right? Monroe Trotter is arrested for his activities. This is what we call the famous Boston Riot. 
The Boston riot, as I'm explaining here, of course, is a growth out of the Afro-American Council. It's a response to what happens in Louisville, Kentucky. Right? And we don't talk about that, that this is actually a continuation of a political fight that's been really occurring since 1902. It comes all the way around. By that time in 1903, you've already got Souls of Black Folk being published by Du Bois, where he writes the third chapter of Booker T. Washington and others, which everyone looks at as the most damning statement by Du Bois on Washington. It's not at all. It's a slap on the wrist. It's a fairly, I mean, he's mad, there's no question, but he's not that mad. The angry letter or the angry article will come the next year in 1904 when he publishes an article in a, in a magazine called The World Today in a series of articles, a number of blacks write series of articles, and that is called Parting of the Ways. Now, of course, that title right there should tell you that he wants nothing more to do with him. Right? And to, to lead us into this then, what comes out of this fight within the Afro-American Council is this group of people that decide that they're going to create a more radical organization to stand up for black political rights. And that organization ultimately comes the Niagara Movement, which is formed in 1905. And in 1905, this organization brings things together, creates themselves up in Buffalo, New York, and they create what they claim is a radical organization. When you look at the platform of the organization, it is no different than the Afro-American League, which was formed in 1890. In fact, I argue that Du Bois's first speech as the Secretary General of the, Af of the Niagara Movement doesn't even come close, doesn't hold a candle to what Fortune is saying in 1890, as far as the need for black political organization. Right? The 1906 speech in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, the second meeting of the, of the Niagara Movement, is much closer to Du Bois's, or to Fortune's rhetoric and anger and positioning. In 1905, while the Niagara Movement is forming, the state of Georgia is el eliminating the Negro militia. They're telling the black population that you're no longer able to carry guns and be part of the National Guard. Booker T. Washington writes a letter to a guy named J.D. Uh, Wetmore. J.D. Wetmore is an interesting man. He's a lawyer out of Jacksonville, Florida. By 1905, he's already been successful with the Afro-American Council, local Afro-American councils in Jacksonville and Pensacola, Florida, saying challenging streetcar segregation, leading boycotts, and winning cases. They ultimately get overturned, but he wins them. Right? T. Thomas Fortune calls him the fighting lawyer from Florida, right? J.D. Wetmore, for those of you who know African American literature, J.D. Wetmore is the ex-colored man. J.D. Wetmore's best friend is James Weldon Johnson. J.D. Wetmore goes to the University of Michigan to study law, gets off the train, and everyone thinks he's white. He says, I am white. Continues to sc study school, goes back down to Florida, begins to practice within the black community, his law, reads these civil rights cases. And in 1905, he becomes the lead counsel of the Afro-American, of the lead lawyer of the Afro-American Council. Ultimately, will move to New York and practice law in Brooklyn and Manhattan. Right. Washington writes him in 1905 and says, you know, the federal government just eliminated the Negro militia in Georgia. The state government of Georgia just eliminated the Negro militia. And we need to take this to the courts because it's against federal law that we need to stand up for our rights, but most importantly, read between the lines, we need to keep our guns because if we don't, we will be disseminated. We have no protection. This is happening at the exact same time that the Niagara Movement is coming, meeting in, in New York and saying we're creating an organization to overturn this conservative backwards leadership of Booker T. Washington, right? And we have no one standing up and speaking in the same type of rhetoric out of Georgia. Where does Du Bois live in 1905? Atlanta, Georgia. Hershaw, Atlanta, Georgia, right? Now there is an argument that neither one of them could speak because they'll be in serious trouble if they do stick their head out in Georgia, right? And no one else knows that actually Washington is writing J.D. Whitmore. 
So Washington is hiding behind the scenes once again. Right? But that is the problem. Because by continually hiding behind the scenes, you have the black community needing, feeling that they need to organize in a different way. Right? And create something new. When all you're doing is creating the same thing. And Du Bois and a guy named Bishop Walters, who is the president of the Afro-American Council, come to the conclusion in 1908 that they need to create a, a unified civil rights organization and bring together the Niagara Movement and the Afro-American Council, the Constitution League, which is another organization we can talk about in question and answer, and the Committee of Twelve, which is again another organization we can talk about. We need to bring all these organizations under one umbrella and begin to have a unified voice, not pull our money apart by having membership in multiple groups, pool our money together and have one unified effort. And then, of course, in 1908, you have the Springfield riots, Springfield, Illinois riots, and you have a man named William Wallings writing a letter calling out, where are the old abolitionists to speak for the black community and come together and, and argue for black rights? Where is that community of black and white activists who stand up? Now, you know Du Bois and, and Walters are sitting back going, um, hello, we've been here? Where have you been? Why have you not been supporting us? And so when they bring together the National Negro Con Conference in 1909, the members of that conference, Ida B. Wells, Du Bois, Alexander Walters, a man named William Sinclair, also a member of the Afro-American Council in the, com committee, uh, the Constitution League, right? a person named John Milhound, a white individual who started the Constitution League, Oswald Garrison Villard, who spoke before the Afro-American Council in 1906 and said he's Garrison's grandson, right? And he stands before the council and says, we need a defense league. We need a lawyer, a defense fund, right? And of course, we all know where that begins to develop. Right? So these people come together and begin to form a new organization, a new civil rights voice. And that group is, of course, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. But if you look at the original call for that organization, it's executive directors, executive committee, excuse me, right? On down the line, the backbone of that organization are individuals, black individuals, who have been members or supporters at different times of the Afro-American League, the Afro-American Council, the Niagara Movement, the Committee of Twelve, and the Constitution League. 27, 24 to 27 individuals who signed, of the original 40 who signed the call, so over half are all members of these previous organizations. So what the NAACP gets is these hardened activists who have done trial and error on these events, right? and challenged this nation. And so the NAACP gets this experience coming into the ground level off the bat. And I'll leave it at that.